Hello and welcome to this video on ultrasound image formation. My name is Andras Nikovic. So the purpose of this talk is really to give you a little bit of an in-depth um, explanation what's behind your image optimization. So as you take your images, your videos, your loops, you'll find that um, you'll have to change constantly your settings, your ultrasound settings to get the best images out of that system. And at the least for each ultrasound image that you're taking, you, you need to think about these five things. So first of all, you'll have to select the right transducer for whatever you're imaging some types of transducers are better for abdominal imaging uh, other, ima um, other imaging probes are better for vascular imaging if there's a if there's an option to select different frequencies for that probe then you'll have to think about that as well and then change uh, the frequency of the probe once you have your image then you will have to set your overall gain or you can use your time gain compensation to decide the brightness or whiteness of your image. Focus position. In most ultrasound systems, you set the focus depth yourself. Other manufacturers claim that they have an autofocus. Uh, anyhow, always think about to set your focus whichever structure you're imaging or whichever structure you're interested in. You set your focus for that uh, depth. The overall image depth is an important part of image optimization as well. You don't want to waste half of your screen for things that you're not interested in. So always think about setting your depth correctly. And then quite important, and we, we tend to forget about this, uh, the sector width, where when you're only interested in a, in, a sh in a small, narrower part of your image or screen, then you can change the sector width so that all your computing power and all your ultrasound machine is only focusing on that little bit of the screen. Hence, you're going to get a better quality image out of all this. So please try to think about these five things every time you take an image or every time you move on to your next image or next video or next little loop. Each time please uh, change these settings to optimize yourself for that particular image that you're doing right then. So let's start with the very basics of sound and, and, and medical ultrasound, really. For any sound, you need a sound source. So you pluck a cord or you use a drum, and that way it starts to resonate. And then that resonation or oscillation will be transmitted over air. And then through the air, the air particles will transmit that sound to our ears and then we, we can hear that sound. In the case of medical ultrasound, you have your sound source, which is your ultrasound machine, and that will create the ultrasound, which will travel into your tissues. And there, there'll be some interactions with those tissues. And then based on those interactions, you will find that echoes will be generated and then these echoes will bounce back and the ultrasound machine will create an image out of that. So that's really the basis of ultrasound image formation. But before that we have to talk about just sound and sound waves. In nature there are two types or two major types of waves. You have your transverse waves and the longitudinal waves. Sound is in the longitudinal uh, type. So sound waves travel longitudinally. That means that the particle displacement, so the direction of propagation is, is this way. So then the particle displacement will be parallel to that. So it's in the same direction as the uh, direction of propagation. The other one, the transverse wave, uh, 
you find that, for example, when you throw a stone into a pond, so direction of propagation will be outwards from that point where you threw the stone, but the actual the water particles will be moving up and down, so that's um, perpendicular to the direction of propagation of that wave. So sound waves are longitudinal waves. And all sound waves, you can think of them as, as pressure. So they sort of, a pressure wave, a pressure wave front is traveling forwards in some sort of a medium, like in air, for example. And that pressure wave front does have some energy related to it because as it's traveling through the media, that energy will make the particles in that medium oscillate. So particles will start to, to oscillate, so they jiggle around as the pressure wave front moves forwards in that medium. There'll be uh, parts of that medium where the particles will be compressed or pushed together. So that's a high pressure zone, which is your compression zone. And then other, uh, as, as the sine wave nature of the sound is, is propagating in that medium, the compression zones will alternate with the low pressure zones, which is your rarefaction zone. So I'll show you what it looks like. In the upper part, you'll find that where there's a medium and all these little particles are undisturbed, this is where there's no sound traveling through that medium. When the sound wave and the wave front is propagating through that medium, the direction is this way, you'll find that these particles, there'll be compression zones where they are being pushed together, and then there'll be rarefaction zones where they are being, being pulled apart from each other. So this, these parts, the compression zones and the rarefaction zones, they are alternating and that's really how the sound is traveling forwards. So as it moves forwards, these bits will be compressed together, but then at the same time, these bits behind will be pulled apart from each other. One important thing to remember that in vacuum, there's no sound. So when Darth Vader's spaceship is zipping past you in, in space, um, creating that, that <laughs> noise, so there's, there's no sound in space, there's no sound in vacuum. You need particles uh, to transmit those sound waves somehow, so there's no sound in space. And this is how we depict uh, the sound wave. So you can think about the sound wave as a sinusoidal or sinus wave. So you'll find that um, the sinus wave is traveling this way and the direction of propagation will be along the line that way. So then uh, that's your baseline here. And above the baseline, you can think about these areas as, as a positive pressure or positive energy zone. So these are your compression zones. And below the baseline, you can think about these as the rarefaction zones. I'll introduce the cycle on this slide. So any two identical parts of the wave and between that, so that's one cycle. So you can pick two troughs, two peaks, or any two parts of two identical parts of that cycle, uh, to the, of that wave. So that's one cycle. What are the properties of that sound wave? So you'll find that amplitude is an important concept that we that we need to understand. And amplitude can be thought of as, um, as, as, a, as a distance. So if you think about uh, how much of those particles will be displaced, uh, 
it's it's a distance also you can think about the amplitude as the the strength or the pressure wave from waveform or how loud that sound is so that's all amplitude and then depending on uh, what you're thinking about it can be measured in distance or or decibels the wavelength on the other hand is related to your cycle length so you see that if you pick two peaks and the distance between those two peaks that's one wavelength and this is shown here with the greek letter lambda so we talked about amplitude and wavelength another important concept is frequency frequency is the the number of cycles passing by in one second so let's say if the time on this one is one second here then the the frequency of this wave will be one two three hertz so see how if there's three wavelengths in that one second that's three hertz so hertz really means that how many things is how many of those cycles are happening in one second so one second so that's just hertz And based on the frequency of the sound, we can divide it, you know, for us humans, we have our audible range, it's somewhere between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. Less than 20 hertz would be in your infrasound zone. And I was curious to see what, what is infrasound? So as you see, like a volcanic eruption or earthquake, so that's this very, very low rumbling sounds. And it, some of that you can't even hear. I mean, us humans, other animals can hear them. And above 20 kilohertz is ultrasound. And medical ultrasound is more in the megahertz range. So let's introduce an important concept. We call that the wave equation. As you see here, the sound, speed of sound, which is denoted by C, C speed of sound equals the number of cycles in a second times wavelength. So wavelength is measured in meters in this case number of cycles per second is hertz and then you get speed speed of sound meters per second so as you see it follows from this equation that if you have a higher frequency sound like so the there'll be a higher frequency which means that the number itself will be higher so this is one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hertz. The other one is a lower frequency sound. So this would be four hertz. And also from this same equation, it follows that if the frequency is higher, then your wavelength will be lower. So smaller wavelength, higher frequency low frequency sound comes with a higher wavelength so there's a an inverse relationship between frequency and wavelength and if you take your speed constant speed of sound constant then you'll find that the wavelength of the ultrasound will be determined by your frequency So let's talk about speed of sound in, in general. When you, when you measure speed of sound, you'll find that um, lowest values will be related to air and gases. In liquids, you have a higher speed of sound in, in general, and solids, you, you get the highest speed of sound.
And the speed of sound in, in various media depends on the density of that medium. Density is depicted here with a Greek letter rho. And really, it, it tells you how dense that material is. So you have your mass per cubic meter. So you, you, you can decide whether you want a cubic meter of feather dropped onto your feet or a cubic meter of steel dropped onto your feet. So you'll, you'll see that a cubic meter of steel will be much heavier uh, than a cubic meter of feather. So that's, that's the density. Another important determinant of the speed of sound is stiffness, which we use the K, letter K for. And this really tells you how well that medium resists being deformed or squeezed. And the relationship between these, the speed of sound, depends on uh, the density as well as uh, your stiffness. So if you think about it this way, so we can think about these two properties as a series of masses and springs. In the upper part of this image, as you see, there's small circles, although that's a less dense material, lower density material, so this is low density. And then in the bottom part of that image, you have those high, larger uh, circles, and that's a high density material. the springs in between those circles. In the upper part, you have a stronger spring, so it's a, it's a much uh, bigger line or, or thicker line connecting those little dots. So that's a stiff material with that strong spring. And in the bottom part, you have uh, less stiff material where the spring is uh, very supple and, and it can move more freely. So you can see that as sound would travel, so it will displace this little uh, M circle here and then as it moves forward, if the material is very stiff, then this very stiff spring will transmit that uh, energy quicker or, you know, like in a more of a, a jolty fashion onto the next circle. So it means that where you have a highly stiff material, you get a high speed of sound. So really, um, it's more related to the stiffness. Because as you see here, when you measure the, the speed of sound in air, you'll find that it's, it's very low. And even though air is a gas and it has a very low density, it also has a very low stiffness. It means that it, it is very highly compressible. So then um, it comes with that um, lax spring. Uh, if you go back to our previous image, so you have a very uh, low stiffness in air. So that's the bottom spring here. So that means that the speed of sound will be very low. Bone, on the other hand, you see here, bone is very stiff. Hence, it will have a very high speed of sound in it. And if you have a look through various tissues in your body and the speed of sound in those tissues, you'll find that they are very close to each other. So within about 5 to 10 percent change between the different tissues in your body. And we average these and we come to that 15, 40 meters per sec. So this is a very important number to remember because every single ultrasound machine, every single ultrasound system assumes that sound is traveling with this speed in your body.
15, 40 meters per sec. And that comes from just averaging all these uh, different tissues. So this is an important number. We use it very often in calculations. So this is something to remember, 15, 40 meters per sec. And if you think about what happens in tissues, and I already spoke about this previously. So let's say we come back to that 15, 40 meters per sec, which is the average speed of sound in different tissues. And then if you take that as a constant and you start using different frequency probes, ultrasound probes and different frequency ultrasounds, then the wavelength will really depend on the ultrasound frequency. And then from your wave equ equation, you can calculate that lambda which is your wavelength, will equal speed of sound over transducer frequency. So let's say in the case of a 2 megahertz transducer, you have 1540 meters per sec over 2 million hertz, and it gives you 0 0.7 millimeter as wavelength. And we know that image resolution is one or two wavelengths, so and you can see it easily that low frequency probes will have a higher wavelength, 0 0.7, and when you compare it to a high frequency probe, you have a 0 0.1 millimeter wavelength. So you have a lower wavelength, hence you have a better resolution. Again, just to drive this message home because this is important, and if you're selecting your probe and if you're selecting your frequency this is what you're thinking about and this is uh, the basis of that so for shorter wavelength you get it from a higher frequency probe think about your vascular probe when you're doing your line placements it gives you a much better resolution all these um, muscle fibers you can see in the sternomastoid muscle However, you can't penetrate very deep because uh, the higher frequency ultrasound is unable to penetrate very deep. On the other hand, when you're using a low frequency probe, abdominal probe, for example, just think about how deep you can, you can look into the body. You, you can see the liver and everything so that it penetrates very deep. However, because low frequency probes come with longer wavelengths, it gives you a worse resolution. Okay, new concept, a new topic. It's the pressure or power of sound and power of ultrasound really. So I, I mentioned already that you can think about sound and ultrasound as a pressure wave front traveling through that medium. And in the case of medical ultrasound, it will travel through your body. It will generate these areas of compression zones where you can think about, the, you can think about these as, as sites of excess pressure. And then there'll be the sites of rarefaction, and these are sites of negative pressure. So when these particles are being pulled apart from each other. So the ultrasound wave front, as it's traveling with this pressure wave, it carries some energy with it. And we measure that in joules. And then if you want to quantify how much energy is being carried per unit time, you get to the power, which is measured in watts. And that's just how many joules per second that sound wave is carrying. And then if you want to know how much of that energy, how much of that power is carried for a unit area. That's the intensity. So you see that on these images. So for a one meter per times one meter, one meter square unit area, you have one watt uh, carried through. So that's the intensity of your ultrasound beam. And it's important because even in medical 
uses of ultrasound, we use very high power, high intensity uh, sounds, and we use that to break stones uh, in your kidneys. So that's a, that's a very high intensity ultrasound. So you see that what number comes with these. So for surgical or therapeutic options you have a very high intensity ultrasound and for diagnostic purposes you don't want a very high intensity sound. Next important concept is acoustic impedance. Acoustic impedance is, is a response of that given medium to a given pressure sound wave what happens in that medium, how quickly those, those little particles are jiggling around, so that's the velocity of particle movement. And it's an important concept, I'll, I'll explain later, but it's really the basis how an ultrasound image is formed. This is a bit of a more uh, complicated concept and, um, and I, I don't really understand the physics behind it but really um, if you think about the speed of sound in air for example which is very low and that's related to that low density um, low stiffness And the acoustic impedance in air will be very low as well. So low speed of sound, low density and low stiffness, it means you have a low acoustic impedance. Where you have bone, for example, where, where there's higher, in, uh, higher density and higher speed of sound, you get a higher acoustic impedance there. So I think, at least in my mind, acoustic impedance is more related to stiffness, again, and speed of sound. So bone, high stiffness, high speed of sound, your acoustic impedance will be higher in that as well. And as you see here, again, uh, related to, so air and then density is very low, propagation speed in air is very low and the acoustic impedance will be very low as well. And the opposite is true for bone. You have a very high density, a very high speed of sound and there will be a high acoustic impedance related to bone. And ultrasound image will be formed where the ultrasound beam will encounter a boundary between two different media with different speeds of sound and with different acoustic impedances. So acoustic impedance number one and acoustic impedance number two, they different, so the ultrasound beam will behave differently because it's encountering this boundary between two media with different acoustic impedances. So that's, that's again, it's an important concept and this is related to the acoustic impedance of that medium. And as you see here, so I put this other table up there, the acoustic impedances of various tissues are pretty close to each other. As you see here, so liver and kidney and blood, so they all all pretty close to each other. So it means that uh, ultrasound will travel fairly easily between those two, between any of these two. So from blood into fat and from fat into kidney and from kidney into liver. So you have an easily uh, so the sound wave will travel easily between these. However, air has a very low acoustic impedance. Bone has a very high acoustic impedance. So any two of these combinations, so from air into 
blood or from bone into blood, there'll be less sound traveling through between these two. So let's see what happens where you find an interface between the two different acoustic impedances. So first of all, we'll look at reflection. So it means that the incoming wave or incoming sound or ray will be reflected back from that surface. And as you see here, the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection will be exactly the same. So this is reflection. And how much is reflected is governed by the differences between acoustic impedances. So you'll see that, for example, liver and kidney, they are fairly similar in their acoustic impedances. So reflection coefficient is very low, so it means that the sound will travel through more freely. Another example done here, so you see how between air and liver. So air had a very low acoustic impedance compared to liver. So it means that their acoustic impedances are very different. So then there'll be a lot more of that ultrasound reflected back from that surface. So that's the basis really, how much ultrasound is able to penetrate deeper and deeper into the body and how much ultrasound will be reflected. That's all based on the differences between acoustic impedances. And if you want to uh, look at it in a, in a bit of a, from a different angle, so you'll see how the ultrasound will start traveling this way. So between bone and soft tissues, there is a difference between the acoustic impedances there. Um, so only about 57% uh, will be reflected. Where the ultrasound beam encounters an air soft tissue interface, you'll see that the acoustic impedances are very, very different. So there'll be a reflection coefficient which is very high. So it means that 99.95% of that ultrasound will be reflected, which is practically all of it. So very, very, very little will travel into that tissue. And that's why when you're thinking about your lung ultrasound and you're applying your ultrasound probe and you're encountering an air tissue interface on the pleura, you'll find that you can't see anything behind the pleura. So everything here is just artifact because the ultrasound is unable to penetrate there. So it's not able to give you real image of what's behind the pleura. So that's again is an important concept when you're thinking about your everyday ultrasound skills. And this is why you need the coupling agent. When you apply the ultrasound probe on your skin, there's always a very thin layer of air between the skin and the ultrasound probe. And because of what we've just discussed then, all of your ultrasound beam will be reflected unless you're using jelly to get rid of that thin layer of air so that you make it possible for that ultrasound beam to enter the body. So there'll be no air in that equation so that you're able to get your ultrasound images. So let's see what happens when you apply your ultrasound beam. So we were talking about reflection and there's different types of reflectors. So I'll introduce the concept of a specular reflector, which is a smooth surface. And then you can think about that you might have small particles like red blood cells. And when the ultrasound beam hits these, they will reflect that ultrasound beam. However, it's very small. Their size is very small 
So they're going to scatter the ultrasound beam. So instead of just reflecting it in, in one direction, they reflect it in all sorts of different, re, re, uh, different directions. So these are called scatterers. So let's see what happens when you apply the ultrasound probe. Let's say you used some jelly here to get rid of the air so that you're able to penetrate the body. So the ultrasound beam will start traveling in, in, in your body and then it will, it will encounter some interface. I don't know, let's say uh, your right ventricular wall and the right ventricular cavity. So that's an interface between two different tissues. So some of that ultrasound beam will be scattered away because it's not a specular reflector. Some of it will be reflected straight into the ultrasound probe. And some of it um, will be reflected away from the ultrasound probe. And as we discussed, or we will discuss in, 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 the, in the next few slides, some of that ultrasound beam will be um, deflected in other directions or refracted into other directions. But nevertheless, all of these things will happen to, the, to your ultrasound beam. So as it travels forwards, this is a less thick arrow, as you see, so it gets less and less strong. Also, as it goes deeper and deeper, it will get absorbed as well. There'll be some heat generation. So then as you go deeper and deeper into the body, it will get less and less energetic, intense power will reduce. So you get less and less sound and it dissipates and then it just disappears at a given depth. So this is really what happens to your ultrasound beam in your body. So let's talk about scattering and reflection just a little bit more. If you think about the specular reflector, which is again, it's a large smooth surface. So for example, uh, pericardium or a pleura or a peritoneum can act as a specular reflector. You'll get, depending on the differences between the acoustic impedances between the two areas, you get some of that ultrasound beam reflected, some of that will be uh, traveling forward, some of that will be refracted. So that's, that's very uh, interesting to think about what happens to that sound, but some of that will travel back to your ultrasound transducer, so then you can build your image from it. And that is if you hit that specular reflector at, uh, at a perpendicular angle or you can hit it at a side angle as well. So that way some of that will be reflected, some of that will be refracted, some of that will travel through. If you hit that specular reflector uh, end on, so parallel to your ultrasound beam is the specular reflector. Then you experience something called a dropout. And that means that you can't really interrogate what's here because you won't be able to see it. So for example, that's behind the, wh why do we interrogate the interatrial septum for an ASD? in the apical four chamber view instead of the no i i said it wrong so why do we interrogate the interatrial septum in the subcostal image where the atrial septum will be in this direction so the ultrasound beam will hit it that way instead of the apical four chamber view where the interatrial septum is in this direction and the ultrasound beam travels that way. So that's your dropout. If, even if there's a hole and there's an ASD, you won't be able to see it from this direction. However, you will be able to see it from this direction because there's no dropout.
So that's an important concept there. Scattering, scatterers. So I, talk, I talked about red cells, those are scatterers. However, not only red cells can be scatterers like here, some uneven surfaces can act as scatterers. So for example, when there's an irregularity to your pleural line, for whatever reason, uh, inflammation or, or anything, thickened pleura, then you'll find that the ultrasound beam will be reflected in all sorts of different directions. So even uh, a larger surface can act as a scatterer. Refraction. So what happens when the ultrasound beam is traveling through and it finds that boundary between two different media? So the acoustic impedances will be different between these two media. And as you see, the red one will have a higher acoustic impedance and the yellow one here will have a lower acoustic impedance. And, and the laws of physics are such that if this happens, then the ultrasound beam will be refracted so that the angle of that will be less than the angle of incidence it's here. So this is Snell's law. The other way around, where the acoustic impedance of media one and media two, so the, the second one is lower, you see how the ultrasound beam this time, it's traveling and then it's refracted away from that line, so that the angle here is larger than the angle of incidence. So that is, again, it's governed by Snell's law. And you, you, you don't really need to know, we, we don't really need to know the details of, of this. It's just really to, to, to show you why some of uh, artifacts are, are happening because of this, because of that change in acoustic impedance and because the ultrasound beam is actually not following the expected path, but it's taking a different direction. And that's really based on this. All right, so, so far we have talked about scattering and scatterers, reflection. We talked about refraction, where the ultrasound beam is bent away. And all these are really part of that attenuation. So the ultrasound beam gets less and less and less as it's traveling through the body. And that's related to some scattering, some reflection, there'll be some refraction, and then all of that is, is really reducing the, the strength and the power of your ultrasound beam. There are other things that are happening to the ultrasound beam and important of those is absorption. And really that means that as you go deeper in the body, as the ultrasound beam will get less and less for various reasons, for reflection, for refraction and all those things, also absorption, the, the actual amplitude or strength or power or loudness, whichever way you want to look at it, will be less and less as you go deeper. And some of that is absorption. Absorption really means that the energy of your ultrasound will be transformed into heat. And it, as it m travels deeper and deeper, it will the, the power, the strength will be less and less. And that depends mostly on frequency, the frequency of the sound, frequency of your ultrasound. The higher the frequency, the more chance the ultrasound beam has to interact with tissues. So if you, I think I, it's, it's, it's kind of self-explanatory. So high frequency ultrasound, you'll see how it's moving forwards and then it's displacing those particles and then 
because of that high frequency, there's a lot of chance for that ultrasound to interact with tissues. Hence, there'll be a lot more absorption, a lot more uh, heat energy formation. So that, that's why a higher uh, um, frequency ultrasound will be unable to travel as deep. Low frequency ultrasound, on the other hand, um, with a longer wavelength, you'll find that it has less opportunity to interact with your tissues. Hence, lower frequency ultrasound will penetrate deeper. Again, this is an important concept to understand, and this is behind the differences between various ultrasound probes. And you see that different tissues have different values of attenuation. So some tissues like bone is, is really um, attenuating your ultrasound beam a lot. And that's why you can't really see much behind bones because uh, the bone will attenuate your ultrasound beam quite a lot. And as you see here, so water has a very low attenuation coefficient, and then the other tissues are, are somewhat different in it as well. So the more structure your tissue has, like a muscle here or a liver has a very fine stru structure, then it, it will attenuate your ultrasound beam more and more, meaning that as it gets deeper and deeper, uh, it will lose its energy. And one way to, to fight that, really, is to use your gain. So you can imagine that because of that attenuation, the ultrasound echoes that are coming back from your deeper parts of the screen will be fainter. They'll be less white, less bright. But for your eyes, you, you'd really want quite a uniform brightness and whiteness for all dots in all parts of your screen. You want these dots to be roughly the same brightness, the same whiteness, so that that image is really uniform. And then you can compare different things uh, in different parts of that image. To overcome that, you can use your time gain compensation where you have your far field and you have your near field and you can change the gain. Gain is really only is doing what, what it's doing is to increase the intensity of the received uh, echoes. It doesn't change your image quality in any way. It doesn't change your resolution. It doesn't change the, the actual information that's coming back with those echoes. However, you can kind of artificially, you can make these dots in the far field look brighter so that they as bright as your dots in the, for, in the, in the near field. So that's how you get the brightness quite uniform in all parts of your image. In some machines, you have just the, the near field and the far field and an overall gain. In other machines, you will have that time gain compensation. We call that TGC, where you have a lot of different slides. And then you can set the, the gain on these slides depending on with what depth of the image you're doing. So time gain compensation is really that, that different parts of the screen, you change your gain. OK, next important concept is diffraction. And again, this is getting into very uh, complicated physics, which I don't understand. And, and I don't think we, we have to get into it much deeper than this. However, as, as, as a minimum, bare minimum, we, we have to think about so different waves, different sound waves and other waves in nature, depending on their phase, whether they are in the same phase or out of phase with each other, they interact with each other in a different way. And they can add 
together, see how the amplitude of this one is higher, so they can interact uh, constructively or they can interact destructively. It, when, when they are out of phase, then they just um, cancel each other out. And that's what happens with the ultrasound probe as well. So later on, I will show you the, the anatomy of the ultrasound probe. However, there'll be various uh, crystals generating the ultrasound beam, and various ultrasound beams will be formed along the way of that ultrasound probe. And these waves and these uh, pressure wave fronts will interact with each other, cancelling each other out or or augmenting each other, and they will create this nice and pretty uh, pattern here. See how the main ultrasound beam in the middle, which is we're interested in, and we would like to know the returning echoes from that. However, because of that, because of that um, diffraction that uh, I've just showed you here, because of that diffraction, you'll find that there'll be side lobes as well. So not just the main lobe of the ultrasound beam, but because of this diffraction, there'll be side lobes generated. And these side lobes will generate, unfortunately, some images themselves. And they will create quite important artifacts. Uh, for example, uh, things that can look like an aortic dissection flap. So you, you'll, you'll find it in one of the next lectures that when we're going to cover artifacts. And that's because of this, and that's because of the nature of the sound and the interaction of, of those different sound wave fronts. Because what happens is the ultrasound beam tends to uh, diverge as it goes out of the ultrasound probe. So you have your near zone, and then in the far zone, it tends to, to diverge. It's spreading out, the beam is spreading out. And what you can do about it, you can uh, focus the sound and use a focal zone somewhere in the middle of that image where you have the best quality sound waves, uh, not too much spreading out like in the far field so that your image quality will be best in that focal zone. Hence my first message on that first slide always adjust your focal zone wherever you're imaging so along the the beam path just try to move your focal zone depending on what you're imaging. And that's how they do it. So they can use this acoustic lens and that will focus your ultrasound beams into the focal zone or into the focal position. Okay, let's talk about the ultrasound probe and the anatomy of the ultrasound probe. The, the heart of the ultrasound probe is the piezoelectric crystal. So this is the one where they say you shouldn't drop the probe because you break the crystal but I know we dropped the probe many times and it never broke, so it's probably a bit more sturdy than that, but nevertheless, try not to drop it anyhow. So when you apply electrical current to this crystal, it starts to expand and contract, and then start to oscillate, and it, because of that oscillation, it will generate sound, it will generate ultrasound. And then the opposite happens um, when the sound waves or the echoes are traveling back from the body, then the piezoelectric crystal, as the sound waves are hitting the piezoelectric crystal, and this movement will be transformed into electrical signal or transduce, so really that's the transducer to change between two different forms of, of energy. So these piezoelectric materials, you can use quartz, which is natural occurring, but most of our ultrasound systems use lead siliconate titanate, which is a synthetic ceramic material. And 
a thin crystal will generate high frequency ultrasound and a thicker crystal will generate low frequency ultrasound. And this is what it looks like. So you have your crystal and then behind that is this backing layer which really is, is it, it only is meant to direct your ultrasound wave out of the probe so that your ultrasound will leave uh, the probe forwards only, not backwards. And then you can use this acoustic lens here just to, to try to, to focus your ultrasound beam into that focus position. And what are the different probes that exist in clinical practice? So there's more than these three, but um, for ICU focus, usually we use these. So you have your linear array probe, which we use for vascular ultrasound. So this is um, usually a high frequency probe, so somewhere around 10 megahertz or some, something like that. The curvilinear probe in the middle, which we use for abdominal imaging, this is a low frequency probe and uh, we use it for better penetration. And the phased array probe, which again is a low, lower frequency probe, so one to four uh, megahertz. This probe is used for cardiac imaging. The footprint of this probe is smaller, so that, <coughs> so that you can get into the rib space uh, a bit easier. So what's the difference between these probes? As you see, for the linear probe, the piezo piezoelectric crystals are arranged in a way that they parallel with each other, so that each scan line will be parallel with the previous one, and you're going to receive a rectangular image. A rectangular uh, image will be formed. The curvilinear probe, the little piezoelectric crystals are still arranged parallel with each other. However, this is uh, on a curve so that the actual scan lines will fan out as they move deeper and deeper. So with that, you're going to get the, the shape like so. So this is your curvilinear or abdominal probe. So the, the scan lines are all uh, coming out from the piezoelectric crystals. The phased array probe, which is the third one, which this is what we use for cardiac ultrasound. So the, each piezoelectric crystal will be um, receiving uh, the impulse just slightly a bit later than the previous one. So that's what they mean by being phased. So the, the electrical signal will be phased in and out uh, into these piezoelectric crystals. And as you see, uh, with that little time delay from the piezoelectric crystal, they will kind of form a wave front, and then that's going to be the, the propagation of, of travel or the, the direction of travel of that wave front. So that's the, the cardiac probe. And with that, um, all, all this information will be processed into an image that looks like this. So like, that's the pizza slice where your ultrasound probe is right here. So that this is a bit more complicated than the other two, but that's the difference between uh, the linear, curvy linear, in the phased array probes. Okay, what does the transducer do? It emits a pulse and the same transducer is used as the receiver of that pulse. So really what you're doing is you're emitting a pulse and that travels into the tissues. So let's say um, there's a heart here. It travels into the heart, it creates an echo and that echo will travel back into the transducer and the transducer will detect that echo. So this is really what happens. The ultrasound probe will emit a pulse and then it waits and listens. And then once the 
returning echoes arrived back to that probe again it will emit the next pulse and then waits and listens so the length of that pulse we call that spatial pulse length so that's the length of the pulse spatial pulse length or pulse duration if you if you want to think about time so that's pulse duration so really it, it, it's just it's that exactly that what what it says so that's the the length of that pulse and this image is, is a bit out of proportion because most of the time most ultrasounds use a short pulse and then a long long waiting time and then again a short pulse and then a long 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 waiting time so in terms of time most of the time of the ultrasound machine is is spent with waiting and listening and very little time is spent with actual pulses and emitting those pulses Again, pulse duration is the duration of one pulse from start to finish. And another important thing to remember is the pulse repetition period, which is from the start of one pulse to the start of your next pulse. So that's your pulse repetition period. And if you count these in one second, you get your pulse repetition frequency. So that's your PRF, which is a very important concept again. So I'd like to draw your attention to this because I'm gonna be referring to this a lot, especially when we're gonna start talking about Doppler. So that's on this screen, you'll see that the pulse repetition frequency is three Hertz because we had three pulses with their waiting times at the end. So I, I cut the, the, the waiting time off that end. But so this screen shows you a PRF of three hertz. This hertz is different from your ultrasound frequency or probe frequency. This is a hertz. And again, hertz only means that per second. So this is three pulse repetition periods per second. And again, I know I'm repeating myself a lot, but, but this is an important concept and, and it's not very easy to understand. So um, that's why I'm spending quite a lot of time on this slide. So duty factor will be uh, the, the fraction of time spent with the actual pulse, pulse duration and the pulse, and, and then the time after that spent with uh, waiting and listening. And most ultrasound machines have very, very short pulse durations and a very, very long listening time. So as you see, 0.1% to 1% um, of the time is spent only with uh, the pulses themselves. And these are microsecond long, really. So these are very short. And then the rest of the time, like most of the time really, is spent with waiting and listening for returning echoes. And that's what happens. I, I showed you this already. So you have your probe, it gives out this pulse and it's traveling into the tissues and the tissues will generate those echoes. And then the returning pulse is coming back into the same probe and that same probe will um, transduce this uh, sound energy into electricity and then it will give you the image at the other end. And what happens exactly, each scan line will be produced separately. So you will get your first scan line, you emit your pulse here, and it's traveling all the way, all the way to the end, and then the returning echoes will reach the, the, the probe. And then the second scan line can start, so the, the, your, you are emitting your pulse, and then along the scan line it reaches the bottom of your screen and then you get your returning pulse your returning echoes it reaches and then after that you can start your third scan line with the pulse so again it has to travel all the way to the edge of the screen and then you have your echo returning back and that 
and then and so on and, and you can see how all the rest of these scan lines are being produced I don't know 128 256 per sector it depends really on your sector size so you can imagine that if you set your sector with very very thick or very very broad, or wide then there'll be many 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 more scan lines needing more time for that echo to um, reach the edge and then come back to the probe if you have a, a narrower sector like so then you only have a, only a few sector lines there so that's really how um, it uh, is produced the image by the ultrasound machine and you'll see here, so I, I introduced this equation, which is, I'm going to come back to this uh, a lot, that the depth, the imaging depth, which is D here, you, you need to travel that depth at the speed of sound in that medium, and then the time required to travel, really it depends on depth. So the sound wave will travel all the way to the depth and then come back. So the, the deeper your depth, the, the larger your depth, the more time is required for the sound wave to come back. So then um, that will have an effect on your image quality. Because if you have a deeper depth, then of course it means that that pulse will have to travel much deeper and then return back into the ultrasound probe if, if you compare it with a less deep depth so and it's all time and and if you spend more time with waiting it means that you can have so you can imagine that each of these scan lines will take longer to come back to the ultrasound machine or ultrasound probe so then you have to emit one scan line and then you wait and then the next one and then you wait and then the next one and you wait and it means that the the deeper they have to travel the longer it takes for them to come back and then again it's deep it takes longer to come back so that's why you have a longer pulse repetition period because the listening time is longer and that means that the pulse repetition period will be longer and you remember that pulse repetition frequency equals how many pulse repetition periods there is in one second so you have your uh, five pulses in one second so you have um, that's 5 Hertz, so 5 PR, PRPs per second. So that if you have a deeper field, then your PRP will be longer and your PRF will be less. Because there's another concept which is called the frame rate. So how many ultrasound images the ultrasound machine can generate in one second. So again, just think back what I just showed you before. So one image is all these scan lines. And then the second image will be the same scan line. So you have to go through all these, I don't know, 128 scan lines. And then again, the third image will be the same number of scan lines. And then each of these scan lines will take some time to, to construct. So then when your first image is done, after that you, your ultrasound machine can move to your second image and the third image. And all that time that is taken to take that image, um, it will depend on how deep those ultrasound beams will have to travel. And then um, how many of these images you can fit into one second so that will be your frame rate which is again a hertz but is but it's a different hertz it's it's it, it again yet again a different hertz which is really just a movie uh, frame frequency so how many frames you have in one second on your picture on your screen 
and that is how choppy that movie is. So if you have a high frame rate, then you have a very nice and smooth movie. And it, ideally it should be around 40 or and above to, to get a nice uh, smooth movie to show you what's happening with different structures. Because when your frame rate is too low, then it becomes choppy and you, you don't know what's happening to your structures be between those images that are formed. So let's talk about image resolution. And within that, you have your spatial resolution, which is axial and lateral. And you have your contrast resolution and you have your temporal or time wise uh, resolution. So let's start with spatial resolution. And again, I'm referring back to uh, this image because axial resolution really it means that um, in the direction of travel of the ultrasound beam, if there's two objects, whether these two objects will be shown as two separate objects on your screen, or whether they will be two objects blurring together. So the ultra, whether the ultrasound beam is able to see these two things separate or it, it's unable to see these two things separate and then it just puts one dot on your screen. So that's axial resolution. And it, re and it depends on your spatial pulse length and the wavelength really. So usually this um, pulse is made up of two or four um, wavelengths or two or four cycles of, of sound or ultrasound. And then we know that the axial resolution is one to two wavelength. So you'll see and you, you it's kind of, um, you can see how this explains that. So let's say you want to resolve these two things here and if they within uh, that uh, two or four wavelength worth of pulse, then uh, you'll be able to um, you'll be able to resolve it. If these two dots are, are too close to each other, so that you won't get a full cycle between them, then the ultrasound machine will not be able to resolve that as two separate dots. So really. Um, the spatial pulse length divided by two is your axial resolution. And because that spatial, because of that pulse is made up of two or four cycles, then you, you know that your resolution will be one to two wavelength. And that's the resolution for axial resolution. So let's calculate the wavelength of the ultrasound of a 5 megahertz probe. So I showed you this before on the, in that table. So you take the speed of sound in tissues as a, as a given, 15, 40 meters per sec, that's the average. And then the wavelength will be speed of sound over frequency of ultrasound and your wavelength is 0 0.3 millimeters. And the resolution, axial resolution will be one to two wavelength, which is uh, 0 0.3 to 0 0.6 millimeters. So how can you improve your axial resolution? You improve your axial resolution by changing to a higher frequency probe because with higher frequency you get a shorter wavelength, hence you have a better axial resolution. And in any way, axial resolution will be superior to lateral resolution. So that means that linear measurements are best performed in the axial plane. So what does this mean in, in real life? Again, when you, when you think about why do we measure the LVOT diameter
um, in the parastinal long axis view. So this is your aorta, this is your uh, aortic valve, and you measure your LVOT diameter in this plane. So that's because the axial plane will have a better resolution. So that's why we don't do it in apical five chamber view. So apical five chamber view, your LVOT will be almost perpendicular to your ultrasound beam. So it means that the resolution, lateral resolution will be a bit uh, worse. So that's why we measure length or trying to always measure length in, in the plane, axial plane of that ultrasound beam, so parallel to the ultrasound beam. Lateral resolution, where there's two objects uh, located right next to each other and whether the ultrasound can resolve these two objects as separate or it will give you just the one dot on your image display. So that, that's related uh, to beam width and um, higher frequency probes have a, a, sh a lower beam width. So higher frequency probe has a, has a lower um, beam width. So it means that they have a, a slightly better lateral resolution. And then other ways to improve lateral resolution would be to optimize your focal zone and to minimize gain so that it's not all very white and bright. And if you think about your contrast resolution, you can start thinking about harmonic imaging, which we're going to cover in uh, one of the next talks. And the better temporal resolution, again, is just repeating myself. So you're aiming for a higher frame rate, which is, you know, that movie frame rate, how many images per second the ultrasound machine is generating. And how do you get there? So you use less depth, you narrow your sector width, and then you just use one focal zone. So how do we optimize our images? Uh, in real life. First of all, you select the transducer that you want to use uh, for that particular organ or body part that you're planning to image. And then within that, if you're able to select different frequencies for the ultrasound probe, then you find or you try to get the highest frequency within that so that you get the best quality image, the best resolution. And then you start thinking about uh, your controls, depth. Again, you're trying not to waste a lot of, uh, of your screen just by um, increasing or making your depth way too deep. You're thinking about zooming in. Again, you're reducing the amount of, of that whole screen that you're, you're imaging so that all in all your uh, image quality will be much improved. You're thinking about your focus position. So you set the focus at that depth where you're trying to image something. If you're more looking at the mitral valve than there, if you're more uh, looking at the aortic valve, then you're uh, changing your image or you're changing your focus to that depth. And then um, last but not least, your gain, overall gain and time gain compensation, really just to make your image uniform so that your whiteness and brightness of the dots is uniform all over everywhere on that image. So thank you for listening. My literature and my resources are on the screen here. So these two, and I used quite a lot of info from these books. These are really very good books. So I would recommend 
you buying them uh, the physics book here the Hoskins book is is really very high level physics so I, I don't understand much of it but uh, it's still interesting to see if you're if you're interested in more more in depth then you can read that and then in further lectures I'll be covering other parts of image formation Doppler color and M mode imaging so thank you for listening and I'll see you next time